Our clinical assumptions for many years have been that, well, diabetes is hard enough. It requires multiple self-care behaviors, it requires multiple medications, it requires um, multiple doctor's visits over the course of the year. Depression could be a natural consequence of managing a chronic illness. Um, and in fact, we have literature that suggests that that's true. What we've also learned, though, is that a lifetime history of major depression increases the risk of developing type 2 diabetes later in life. get a group of people who have depression, a group of people who don't have depression, the people with depression are more likely to get diabetes. One of the, the multi-million dollar questions in the area of diabetes and depression is the question of how do these two comorbidities go, go together? And the answer that we have right now is that we don't really truly know at this point. It's important that we learn how these two disorders not only um, co-occur, but then how they may synergistically exacerbate one another. The hypotheses for linking depression to type 2 diabetes biologically are around uh, chronic inflammation and chronic resetting of brain control of metabolism. There are a number of theories that have been posited. Uh, one of those theories um, is the stress response, so that involves the hypothalamic pituitary axis of the brain, and that the stress response may upregulate serotonin production in the brain, and that that may have effects then on both behavior and also biology in terms of blood glucose management. Another hypothesis is in the inflammatory system. We know that inflammation promotes diabetes and depression is associated with inflammation. We have this sort of two-way step between depression and diabetes through an inflammation pathway. The brain control systems are really a, very much a mystery still, and we know that uh, depression is biologically a disordered set of brain controls. It, there's no reason to think that just because it's affecting mood doesn't mean it doesn't spill over into control of metabolism, and, and metabolism is strongly controlled centrally. So there's a sort of broad hypothesis that disordered brain regulation is part of it, but we don't have any of the steps that make those links. But of course, there's behavioral component of depression that can promote diabetes as well. Things like the sedentary behavior that comes with depression or the changes in dietary pattern that come with depression that are then promoting diabetes along the known pathways related to obesity, for example, that don't have any direct relationship to the biological phenomena but are still part of the connection between depression and diabetes. So depression behaviors can promote diabetes independent of any biological phenomenon. Depression lies along a continuum. At one end would be uh, what we now understand to be diabetes-related distress. So that is specific to the experience of managing and living with diabetes. In the middle of the continuum is what we would consider to be depressive symptoms. So those may be transient symptoms of feeling sad or blue or hopeless, feeling a lack of interest in things we would otherwise enjoy, changes in sleep, changes in appetite, changes in concentration, perhaps transient thoughts of death. And then at the far end of the continuum is what we would consider to be diagnosable clinical depression. So, and that has a hierarchy of diagnoses. The top of the hierarchy representing the most severe form is major depressive disorder, in which at least five of those symptoms are present and that those are present most of the day, nearly every day for at least a two week period um, and that that causes impairment. Diabetes is a chronic permanent condition. There are specific instances where we can reverse it and someone can you know, get cured of their diabetes, but for the most part, it's something that you then have from that point forward for the rest of your life. Um, for some people, that's a relatively minor thing, depending on how intensively therapy is needed, but for a lot of people, that's a big deal as they move forward through their life, requiring lots of finger stick testing, lots of insulin injections. It can be a, it can be a real burden that's not just a cost burden, but a personal burden as they move through their lives. We find that one in four patients, um, that's about 21% of patients with type 1 diabetes, and about 27% of patients with type 2 diabetes will have elevated depressive symptoms at some point in their life. When we look at diagnosable clinical depression, we see that rates of depression are somewhere between 11 and 15%. That's true for both type 1 diabetes and for type 2 diabetes. It is in excess of what we see in the general population, and so a cause for concern. 
Not only do we have a larger proportion of people experiencing depressive symptoms and a somewhat larger proportion experiencing clinical depression, but once depression takes hold uh, in people with diabetes, uh, we're finding that it, it, it's lasting much longer. People who have established diabetes who have depression, that's one of the almost impossible barriers to overcome. We observed that, that um, depression was associated uh, with greater severity of diabetes complications, and that has implications for uh, complications, for quality of life, um, and ultimately for uh, functional disability and early mortality. Join us next time when experts discuss collaborative approaches to caring for the physical, mental, and emotional needs of patients with diabetes and depression.